Fellow Pelicans and friends of the UWI, welcome to Pelican Talks, where we, we promote interactive and positive discussion about a variety of topics and engage our UWI alumni across the world and the Caribbean. And it is my pleasure to have as our special guest today, Professor Brian Meeks. Welcome, Professor Meeks. Hi, Celia. Thank you. So let me tell you a little bit about Professor Brian Meeks. He's a very proud Pelican and a triple UWI graduate, once from UWI St. Augustine campus and twice from the UE Mona. He received his BSc from, in social sciences from St. Augustine Trinidad, then his master's in government from Mona, and then again his PhD, again from Mona, in government. Additionally, he pursued postdoctoral work at the Cambridge University where he had a Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellowship at the Center of Latin American Studies and Hughes Hall. He's an academic and has focused much of his academic research on Caribbean politics. His areas of specialization include theories of revolution, comparative Central American and Caribbean politics, Caribbean thinkers and political thought, government and politics in the Caribbean, politics and Jamaican popular culture, African-American politics, African-American political thought, comparative third world politics, introduction to political philosophy, contemporary theories of the state and radical challenges to liberal democracy. The last one being something that could be considered very topical perhaps. He is currently the chair of the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University. And he's also a poet a prolific writer, a political scientist, as I've said, and we'll hear much more about all of these various aspects of his life later. Brian, your career has been fascinating. Let's begin first with your Caribbean roots heritage. Let's start with your parents. Where were they from? My mom, Celia, is from Trinidad, was from Trinidad, um, and my dad, Jamaica. Um, they met while students in Montreal, Canada, at McGill University. Um, where I was born. So I can't say as Peter Sherpington did, I'm on Barnia. <laughs> and I've always uh, found that a little ironic um, in that much of my work has centered on the Caribbean. But of course, I grew up in Jamaica. I came here as a, as a toddler, as an infant really, and um, spent um, all of my growing up in Jamaica, um, um, Kingston. And you were close to Yui growing up? Uh, uh, well, yes, in, indeed, and, and you know, surprisingly, um, uh, in, for, for, from age 11 onwards in Hope Pastures, which had just been built, my parents had, an, had, had a house there where they lived for their entire lives after that. And uh, so I walked to my school, Jamaica College, which was literally down the road. And UWE was always a presence, obviously, because we were on Hope Road, not very far away from it. But a presence both um, geographically, but also intellectually and um, spiritually in many respects. Okay. And we'll talk about that later on. Sure. Well, I know you, you have a family and, um, well, talking about your siblings, are there any other UE Pelicans among your si siblings? Well, my sister is definitely a UE um, Pelican. Um, she graduated from St. Augustine, like me. She's my younger sister, and so we didn't, we didn't cross over. Um, and she is a scientist, Julie, Julie Meeks. Um, and then, of course, she's now um, deputy okay. principal of the Open Campus. Um, you know, when you have younger siblings who achieve great heights, it, you know, it's kind of ironic because you still think of them as your younger sibling, but she has done well for herself. My brother um, is also a Pelican. Um, he started um, in Natsai um, at Mona and then went on to um, do um, dentistry at McGill and orthodontics at Howard University, um, Jeffrey Meeks, and he, he practices, he's a well-known um, orthodontist in Kingston and Montego Bay. Absolutely, so, great. So lots of UE connections. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and I believe additionally your wife? My, my wife, Patsy, is, is a Pelican um, from Mona um, and she actually did two degrees at Mona, uh, her first degree in MassCom, um, then a diploma 
in public administration. Then she went on to Cambridge University to complete her MPhil in international relations and her PhD in history. Um, so she's very much, all of us have, have roots and some branches that connect back to Mona. And of course, she, she taught at Mona for many years as well as I did and left when I did. Okay, very good. And did you meet at Mona? No, we met before Mona. Um, okay. Um, you could say we were married while at Mona. Um, and, um, you know, we both eventually were on the faculty at Mona and spent many happy years in uh, living in uh, University Close and College Common. Um, okay, really uh, lots of ties to, to, to the UWI Mona campus for sure and St. Augustine. Very good. Well, because you, you are both graduates, you're officially a UWI couple. So that's good. Yes, <laughs> yes, we know that. We're well yeah. aware of it. Yes, yes. So um, you had mentioned you went to Jamaica College. I'm sure there's some other Jamaica College uh, graduates out there who are happy to know of this additional connection. What was your favorite subject? Did you, did you start your political thought from then or you had other interests uh, at high school? Uh, interestingly, in, in certainly up until GCEO level, which is the equivalent of, of you know, CXCs, um, I was both science and humanities. Um, I loved history. And we had a remarkable history teacher, Jimmy Carnegie, who was remarkable. Um, but I was also very good at, at sciences, physics. Um, I loved um, space and space travel, which was in its early moments when I was growing up. Um, but at, at, in sixth form, I actually switched over after lower six from a Zukem Fizz, typical um, high school um, major, if you wish, to um, history, econ, and Fizz. They wouldn't allow me to drop all three of my lower six subjects. So I, I ended up with history, econ, and physics. Um, and you know, I'm still a sort of physics buff. I, you know, I love to talk about the universe and its the, the dark holes and that matter and black holes and that kind of thing. So interesting, yeah. we didn't know that. I changed, I changed in midstream of high school, so to speak. Okay, well, I'm very glad that you took this path. That's great. <laughs> so, <Okay. am> I. <laughs> so now about your St. Augustine experiences, Trinidad, Carnival, I know, I know Carnival is maybe in your blood. I know your parents went religiously every year until they were well into their, what, 70s? Until they were well into their 70s, yes, and per okay. perhaps even up to 80. Wow. Um, I, you know, thanks for reminding me. I need to go back and check whether they actually went after they had become octogenarians. But um, they certainly were there well up into their 70s. Um, and um, I, interestingly, um, I am not as avid a carnival person as they were, and um, not as on purpose, but perhaps even regretfully. Um, I don't do carnival as much as, as they did and as, as at least one other member of my family, no names to be called. So, <laughs> um, but um, I certainly appreciate the, the historical and cultural importance of carnival, calypso and soca as an institution from the Southern Caribbean, which has had a remarkable influence on the world, not in quite the same way as a sort of Northern Caribbean reggae um, Rastafari tradition has, but in a profound way in its own right. And indeed, uh, a profound impact on the reggae um, tradition in its early phases. So um, it's, it's all, you know, I, I, I always say I feel fortunate to have um, connections in both Jamaica, you know, my country, um, um, of, of growing up and that I claim, and Trinidad, my mother's country. And it, it gives me a, a kind of pan-Caribbean perspective. And my wife is Grenadian, which is kind of somewhere in between. Um, and so therefore I like to feel that I, because of that, um, and because of my having studied in Trinidad at, at the undergraduate level, I have a pan-Caribbean perspective, mm -hmm. which I value. Yes, absolutely. I believe that you do. 
And your, your St. Augustine experience was, I'm sure, very special. Any particular memories that you'd like to share? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I went to St. Augustine, and, and here's, here's the reveal of my ancient age. I went to St. Augustine in 1970, um, which was a very pe peculiar year. That was the year of the Black Power um, revolt against Eric Williams' government. All we, you know, people who don't know the history are very shocked that there's a Black Power movement against Eric Williams, who was the writer of the very famous volume, Capitalism and Slavery. Um, but when you hear the story, you're not so shocked. But anyway, the story is that I went, um, while the state of emergency, which followed the Black Power Revolt, was actually still in place in the summer, in the late summer of 1970. But more critically, I went because of the Black Power Revolution. Um, I thought that that was where I needed to be. Um, I had other options, uh, university options, um, to the north, and I chose the one to the south, uh, which was sort of counterintuitive from a sort of Jamaica college perspective at the time. Why would I want to go to Trinidad when I can go to New York, for instance? But I, cho I chose the one to the south because I wanted to be there where the action was. Mm. And I haven't regretted a moment of that. Well, absolutely not, because I suppose you, you really kind of witnessed firsthand the difficulties in many countries in the region post-independence um, at that time. And I, you became yeah. Yeah. more politically active um, at that time. But I, it was the 1983 revolution in Grenada where several protesters, as well as the prime minister, were killed that I think kindled your interest in researching what happened. And I think you wrote your PhD dissertation on that. Yeah. Um, and I think Pelicans, especially Grenadians, would be interested that I think you, it is said that it's one of the first academic papers that focused on events in Grenada. Um, okay, so it, you know, I, like, I like to remind everyone that it was a 1979 revolution. People focus on 83, the collapse, the tragic collapse. Oh, okay. Um, as though that was the signal moment. The signal moment was really 79 when Morris Bishop and the New Jewel movement took power and four and a half years interceded before the crisis of October 1983. And so uh, my, my study um, actually started before the, just before the collapse and was really trying to document what was the remarkable things that were happening in Grenada in that period between 1979 and 1983. Um, and I, I thought it would have been one of the first studies. But when, when, the, when the process collapsed and then there was the invasion, almost every Caribbean scholar or, or Caribbeanist scholar began to write about Grenada. So here was I, a poor um, PhD student, trying to come to terms with the history and events of Grenada. And sometimes what seemed to me on a weekly basis, new volumes were coming out um, from you know, very well-respected people in the field to the point where I was saying to myself, why am I even writing when you know all of the greats in Caribbean studies have, have had their say? But you know, the lesson is that your say is always um, different. It's always your perspective. And I always tell my grad students that um, you know, even if 10 people, 20 people have written on a topic, there's always space in scholarship for a new perspective. And I think I did bring a new perspective um, to that subject. Absolutely. I think that's very important and a very key tip for, for students mm -hmm. and, and graduates who are perhaps um, contemplating further tertiary studies. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have, it's an interactive session and we, we're taking questions and comments from on, online. And I have a question now from an open campus graduate in, in Grenada who says, what do you think the Caribbean has learned from the Grenada Revolution? I think there are a number of things that we have, we should learn. I don't know what we have learned and I don't know if we've learned necessarily all the things I think we should learn. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, the question of democracy within organizations as well as outside of organizations. In the case of Grenada, um, the party 
that Raoul Grenada between 1979 and 1983 did some remarkable things at the level of participatory democracy. For example, the annual budget debates, which brought the entire country into a discussion about the national budget was extraordinarily important. But at the same time, it needed to move from a situation of insurrection to one of elections um, and could have done so much sooner and that would have solved some of the problems which arose later on. But there's also a question of inner party democracy, which would have solved some of the problems that led to divisions and crises and inner party democracy was extraordinarily limited. So the question of democracy as um, a practice in popular movements, in political parties, um, is something that I think we learn um, from that process. Um, the other one is guarding our sovereignty. I think that um, when Grenada was invaded, it changed the trajectory of what we thought was possible um, for independent Caribbean countries and limited um, what we began to think was possible. And so the, this was very damaging to us. And we need to recover that sense of possibility of imagination um, which existed before 1983 and which was embodied in, um, in the People's Revolutionary Government. Um, among other institutions in the Caribbean. Um, so there are lots of lessons to be learned. Um, you know, one would have to sit down and really begin to think them through very carefully, which I can't do in a quick response. <laughs> um, surprisingly, I was in Barbados last week and spoke on this question. Um, um, I called it, the paper I gave was Beyond Tragedy, Revisiting Emancipation in the Grenada Revolution. Um, and hopefully at some point in the future it will be published. But I think the name gives away um, where I'm going. I think we're focused on the tragedy, which we need to, and we have done for the past 30 years. Um, but beyond tragedy, there were questions that were put on the table in Grenada, um, which go back to emancipation and freedom, and which we need to revisit um, as we think about the the, the, the negatives, if we want to look at it in a binary way, and the positives in the Grenada Revolution. Very interesting. And at your point about um, Caribbean nations guarding their sovereignty, I think is one that is, is very relevant too today. There is a, the, the global scale, landscape is changing so rapidly um, that uh, I think the, and nationalism is rising um, globally. So it, it's an interesting state of affairs, I guess, globally. Yeah. Um, I have another question coming in, this time from Cave Hill, where you just were, um, yeah. in Barbados, asking, um, so have you been to Grenada? And, and what were your impressions? What did you go for? My wife is Grenadian, um, Patsy Lewis. And um, so we, we go to Grenada as often as we can. Um, and, um, you know, Grenada is a remarkable island as indeed are all the Caribbean islands. Um, and it's resilient. It's managed to, to bounce back in many ways. The people have managed to bounce back from, from the crisis of 1983, from other crises like the 2004, five, was it five, um, Hurricane Ivan, which devastated the country. Um, and the Caribbean people are resilient people. You know, I mean, we are people who escape the, the horrors and ravages of, of slavery, colonialism, indentureship, um, um, and live to fight another day. So I have extraordinary uh, respect, and, and indeed I'm in awe of the Caribbean people as a people. Where I think that we, we need to do some work on is, is, is the question of our governments and our politics. And I think that they are in an awful state. I think we have lost that, you know, I said this before, that sense of possibility mm -hmm. um, of what, of, of, of a project of, of, of national or regional development that transforms the way we, 
we live and, and, and how we live. And that has to begin um, by an entire rethink of what, what is the purpose of um, independence or the purpose of existence in, in its broader sense. Um, and I think we've lost that and we're sort of um, going on from day to day and trying to um, avoid the dollar getting, you know, too out of range in its relationship to the US dollar or, um, you know, balance of trade, you know, sort of minutiae, important minutiae, but, but questions which need to be posed within a broader context. We've lost that and we need to find it again. Um, but yeah, the question of, you know, Grenada, Barbados, um, Jamaica, Trinidad, um, you know, this is the birth of modernity in all its tragedy and horror. Um, this is where modernity begins. Um, and we have lessons to teach the world, um, but we need to find ourselves. Indeed, very profound. Um, I don't know what we're gonna do, but maybe we'll get some suggestions as we, as we go along. Um, another question now from a graduate of the Open Campus in Anguilla who noted that your wife, Patsy, is Grenadian and wants to know her research interest. Thank you. Um, Patsy's research interests are much more fundamentally Caribbean than mine. She works on um, questions of small states. Um, how do small states survive in the world? What are their strategies? Um, she's looked at bananas in the Eastern Caribbean. She has looked at this whole notion of training for export of nurses in places like Jamaica. Um, she's looked at Caribbean integration um, and is one of, of a small number of scholars who, who have sort of traced the whole history of Caribbean integration through its different streams, Federation, CARIFTA, um, you know, CARICOM, um, and the OECS. And she has her own, you know, very um, opinionated notions as to what needs to be done and what isn't being done. And I'm not going to try to explain them, but um, in many respects, I, I, you know, I, she's a far more political economy, practical nuts and bolts old scholar than I am. Okay, interesting. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will now go and look up her work and she might get some questions from this. So we'll see. Absolutely. Okay, a social sciences student at Mona is now asking, um, they say a lot of your work has focused on social and political change and the political and social theories used to interpret change from liberalism to Marxism to post-structuralism. And want, they want to know, how do you define yourself, a political economist or a political theorist or both? Where are you? Um, I used to call myself in my first early iterations as a Caribbean scholar, as a political scientist. Um, but I quickly abandoned that um, because the notion of science is fraught. And um, particularly when it is applied to um, the so-called social sciences. So I prefer to call myself a political theorist, but um, that too is limited because it says that, okay, so I'm concerned with matters of politics, but not matters of social structure, not matters of culture, not matters of interpreting the Caribbean through literature. So um, if, if indeed I'm, I'm trying to do all of these things together, then, um, I need to take the name plate off of my, whatever I try to do. Um, the best one could say is that I'm an interdisciplinary scholar who is trying to, to understand the world, um, starting from a Caribbean foundation with the tools and the, the substance that is available and the methodologies that are available. So I, I, I range across all of those things. Uh, interdisciplinary scholar is probably what I feel most comfortable with today. Today, okay. maybe tomorrow I'll have a different take. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, the works that you've published and you, you've published many, but in 1993, you published Caribbean Revolutions and Revolutionary Theory, an assessment of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Grenada. 
And then you, that was in 93. And then you put out a new edition in, in 2001. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what motivated you for this particular work. Okay, so um, uh, I had published my thesis, um, Social Formation and People's Revolution, a Grenadian study in 1988. I had, um, I had um, not published. I, I was granted my PhD on the basis of writing that thesis in 1988. Um, and the initial plan was just to publish it. To, to, and indeed, I had gone as far as finding a small press in the UK um, and it had reached the stage of being typeset and something happened and it was never published. And I decided at that time that what I needed to do was to move beyond that study and to compare Grenada with uh, two other revolutionary processes that were in the Caribbean. Of course, Cuba, 1959, but also Nicaragua, which is very much in the Caribbean, um, even though we don't consider it um, an, a part of the Antillean Caribbean, um, because it is not. It is, it is um, on the Central American coast, mm -hmm. but it's very much in many respects, particularly on the, on the Caribbean side, a part of the Caribbean, the people, the culture, everything. And so I, I went into this um, study when I was on my... Commonwealth Fellowship at Cambridge, um, which, which decided to, to both compare the three processes, but also delve more fundamentally into theories of revolution, spurred on by a number of, of, of remarkable scholars at Cambridge, in particular, John Donne, who was, is one of the sort of foundational theorists of revolution, who helped me point me in a particular direction, and um, produced that study, which, um, which still, um, I would not have written it like that today, but I'm still quite proud of being the only person that I know of who has just front, frontally compared those three processes um, on the same sort of theoretical um, foundations. Okay, and we're proud of you, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I'm just going to, to list some of your books uh, just for our, our listeners and viewers. Uh, you also have published Critical Interventions in Caribbean Politics and Theory, Envisioning Caribbean Futures, Jamaican Perspectives, Narratives of Resistance, Jamaica, Trinidad and the Caribbean, and Radical Caribbean, um, From Black Power to Abu Bakr. So how long does it take you to write on, and you work on more than one thing at a time? <laughs> um, I consider myself, um, it depends. Um, in the case of Caribbean revolutions, it was pretty much written in a year in which I was on fellowship at Cambridge and I had the best facilities and nothing else to do particularly during the long, cold British winter. <laughs> um, and that book was pretty well written in a year and then revised and published in another six months. Um, Envisioning Caribbean Futures was written in a year and a half. So when you actually have a very clearly defined subject, and you have the resources, um, particularly if a lot of my work requires not so much going into the field like an anthropologist, um, but, but in reading secondary literature, primary literature like newspapers and um, other primary sources, um, and then writing. And so I, I would say that, that that's how it works. The other books, um, interestingly, my last um, single author book, Critical Interventions, was a collection of essays published over 14 years. So, 14 years? Not yeah. really. Um, but, it, but, but they are a collection published over 14 years of essays on, on a range of topics on Caribbean politics and theory, as the name suggests. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, if, 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 if I can find the time and you give me a year, I can probably do 
a lot of work. Um, I also tend to be a, a short distance runner. So, you know, my books might be at 200, 240 pages, that kind of range. And at the 500 page tomes that some of my colleagues um, can produce, which obviously will take a long, much longer time to write. Right. Well, I actually, I think you're, that you're, the students and scholars who read your works yeah. probably enjoy the fact that there are 240 pages because they probably get more from that than having to go to the full 500. They well, it's different, so kinds, it's, different kinds of scholarship, you know? It uh, depends kinds. on what you're doing. Um, you can have a, you know, a short of, sort of short manuscript of 110 pages. And um, you know, it, it can just blow, blow the head off the academy because it, it really concisely and sharply addresses critical issues that are out there in ways that are novel and interesting. And you can take 500 pages and, and it, it, you're lost in it. And you exactly, never so that's my point. We, we, we appreciate your <laughs> concise and, and succinct yeah. Yeah. scholarship. Yeah. Um, I, I know that you're the co-editor of a series of books exploring the work of influential thinkers from the region called Caribbean Reasonings. And you're quoted um, as saying about this, that I have a special role because of where I come from, to focus on the scholars from that region who have made an international impact, but they are also tremendously important wherever they come from in terms of defining contemporary social and political thought. Can you expand on this a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, way back in the late 90s, um, scholarship in the Caribbean was at a low point, my opinion, obviously. Um, I think we'd, we'd lost our direction um, after a period of heightened engagement that kind of climaxed around the time of the collapse of the Grenada Revolution. The 80s and then into the 90s was, was, was a low point. And I've written about this in a number of, of my papers. Um, and I think we had also lost our self-confidence that we could make interventions in the world. I remember going to a conference in New Delhi um, of all places, and speaking to some Indian um, political economists. And they were asking me, what's happened to the Caribbean? I mean, you guys used to produce people like Lloyd Best and um, Norman Gervon and um, the, the George Beckford, the real of names. These are Indian political economists in this country of, of over a billion people but who have time to focus on our, our young post-colonial scholars at a moment when they were making waves across the post-colonial world. And they were wondering what was happening. And I was saying to myself that um, um, something was missing. Um, and one of the things that we thought was necessary was to recapture uh, the work of critical Caribbean scholars for a new generation to see this is what we have done um, and to recognize them in ways that would inspire a new generation of scholars to begin to write with the self-confidence of, of the people that we captured in Caribbean um, reasonings. And so we started the Center for Caribbean Thought. And we also thought it was important that the center should not be located in the North um, where the resources are and where many of our good scholars are, but in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we published, um, I think it's nine volumes in that series over a decade. Um, Stuart Hall, Sylvia Winter, um, George Lamming, the New World Group as a group, M.G. Smith, um, Gordon K. Lewis, um, uh, George Padmore came out as part of the series, even though he was not one of the conferences that we held um, for that series, Richard Hart. So um, uh, what we tried to do in, in a small way, um, you know, we're not the only people doing this. I think the Small Axe um, Collective and their volume um, edited by David Scott, um, um, a colleague and friend who's also a JC graduate um, um, and coming out of Columbia, um, is also doing that kind of work with 
the interviews that Small Axe constantly holds with critical Caribbean thinkers. But um, we, I thought this was a real way in which we could do that. And it lasted for a decade. Um, and it hasn't continued uh, for reasons of history, but um, I, I'm very proud of that fact. That's an amazing contribution, really. Um, I'm just sharing now too, that I have a comment from a graduate of the Cave Hill campus, who she is saying that she didn't know that much about you, but that you're, she's finding the conversation very interesting. So that's good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I know you, as you, we've been discussing, you've edited many books and, and journals as well. And do you enjoy the role of editor? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, th yeah, that's flippant. Um, I, I, um, editing is hard work. It, it involves, first of all, acquiring the people um, who you want to include and their work. Um, you know, somebody said somewhere, academics are like cats and you can't herd cats. Um, <laughs> you know, cats have their own mind and they go Absolutely. their own way. Um, editing a book is a supreme instance of that. Um, you know, people have their own agendas. You have the agenda. You want the book produced. They have their own agendas. They have articles to meet other deadlines. They have teaching to do. They have their own research to do. So it's a difficult job. Um, um, if it's a worthwhile volume and really makes a con contribution at the end of it, when you see it between, um, um, you know, two covers, you feel as though you've accomplished something. And um, I've, you know, over, over time, I've edited quite a few volumes um, and I feel I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did them. But is it work I like? No. Mm -hmm. I, I can control myself, you know, when, I, when I'm tired, I, I just don't write and then feel guilty. Um, and when I'm writing and on a roll, I feel really good. And eventually when it's finished, you feel really, really good. Uh, particularly if some um, publisher somewhere likes it. <laughs> but um, that's you, you know, if you don't do it, then you, you, it's on yourself to blame. But editing, editing is like um, running a business. Yes, yes, I know. It's, 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 it's challenging, but it's you obviously challenging. do it well. Um, it. I just want to let our listeners know, too, that you've written peer-reviewed journal articles as well as book chapters and book reviews. And your academic career basically has been and continues to be outstanding. So kudos to you. Um, we have a graduate now from Trinidad and Tobago who wants you to know that she read your article, Michael Manley's Vision which appeared in Jacobin Magazine and found it very insightful. So that's good. Um, I know Jacobin, you- Jacobin is a great magazine. It's, it's a, yeah. a left-wing online journal of young people. And of course, the name Jacobin um, doesn't come from the original Jacobin of, of, of France, mm -hmm. but from CLR James, Black Jacobins. Oh, okay, okay, interesting, okay. Yeah. Um, you've also presented at many major conferences over your, your career and giving, given many invited lectures. And, and in 2019 alone, you've been to the University, of, University College of London, to the um, University uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's Waters Rand. Right, with Waters Rand, that's right. And um, I, you've come to Mona in March as well, the University of the West Indies, not to be left out. Um, and a graduate of the Open Campus, Dominique, is asking how you fit all of this in your schedule and how do you balance this all? Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, yeah, um, you know, you try to find times. Um, I'm, I, I'm chair of my department here, which means I have administrative duties as well as teaching, obviously and um, advising students, both undergraduate and graduate. And you know, you, you get an invitation like the one I did to go to University College London um, to speak on a panel called After the Event, which looks at the, the postlude of revolutions. It's hard to say no. So what you do is you, you take your electronic diary, which I have now learned how to use properly, and for many years had my paper diary. And I, you know, you kind of mark up things and then you beg people to 
hold a class for you or you do whatever has to be done. You let things lapse so that when you come back, there's a million things on your head. But, um, you know, there's some things you can't avoid. I mean, you know, the things I do, there are three or four other things that could have been on that list that I just said no to um, because it was crazy. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, life is not easy, but you know, um, you try to cut and paste, bob and weave <laughs> as best you can. Yes, and you, you do it well, so that's good. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to mention a couple of the highlights of your career for our, uh, those who are listening in. Um, you are currently professor and chair at, of Africana Studies at Brown University, but before that, you were university director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at, um, of, the, of the university, yeah. and then also of Mona. Um, you've also been a visiting professor at Antandakom University of Suriname. You have been the director of the Center for Caribbean Thought at Mona, and you still are, is that correct? No. I'm no. not no longer director. Okay. So that's if 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 that's what's on my CV, that needs to a, a, an end date needs to be put on that. You need to put an end date on that. <laughs> um, but you were also earlier in your career head of the Department of Government at the University of the West Indies, Mona, and you've done things like being consultants on in electronic media with special emphasis on public affairs to the government of Grenada, managing editor of the Free West Indian Grenadian National Newspaper. You've also been a television producer and researcher at the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation and a member of the board of the, the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation. So you've, you've had a, a varied career with, with, with lots of, your fingers have been in lots of pies over the years. Um, could you share with us any of those mentioned or perhaps some others of the most memorable milestones and achievements? Um, perhaps not so much in academics, but in other things? My, my, my first job, um, no, it's actually my, my first job out of university at Mona was in Carifesta 76, in oh. which I was, um, and that doesn't appear on my CV, um, and I should really put it on. For one year, I, you know, I, I worked as a sort of media person with Carifesta, and myself, and a number of colleagues, including Lorna Goodison and Tony Boggs, who is actually here with me at Brown, um, organized um, with Wycliffe Bennett as overseer, a very important event in the National Stadium, um, which honored heroes of the Caribbean. And um, I, I always see that as, um, you know, something that, you know, very, my, was my very first job. I was in a very junior position, but Wycliffe gave us the, the sort of authority to do this thing. And we were like early 20 year olds, um, very enthusiastic, very radical. And we, we brought all kinds of people here, including CLR James and Walter Rodney, who returned to Jamaica for the first time post his being excluded in 1968 to our event in 1976. Interesting. So, so even though it's not on my CV, I always like to put that down as, as something that I really found exciting. The other thing, of course, is working at the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation as a public um, affairs producer in the, the last four years of the Michael Manley regime, uh, perhaps the most difficult four years in the history of post-colonial Jamaica. Um, and that's a story in its own right. Uh, I've, I've written a little bit about it in, um, in my work. It's captured more in my novel, Paint the Town Red. Not my working at the JBC, but the period is captured in the novel. And, um, but it's, it's still very hard for me to talk about it um, in, in a sort of objective way because of the the difficulties of that period. Um, and maybe someday I'll, I'll write something more substantial. On I think it. that would be very interesting. I think people would, would, would look forward to that. So we'll- Yeah, we'll, well, 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 you know, for young people- Maybe. Yeah, yeah, for young people who were born outside the period or, or who were very young. Um, and if you are very young, you're still not young now. 
So, <laughs> but for young people who are born outside the period, um, um, there are really uh, just a couple of, of novels um, which were written that cover that period. Of course, the famous one is Marlon James, A Brief History of Seven Killings, which recently got the Booker Prize. Very proud of Marlon, who was one of my students, by the way. Oh, really? So, okay, I, I know Marlon, and he, it's amazing. I'm very, absolutely. very proud of him, too. He was one of my students, so I'm, I'm very proud. But um, my book, Paint the Town Red, um, Garfield Ellis's, um, um, I'm, I'm going to miss the title now, um, but it's very, very insightful and important little book, which didn't get much coverage, um, Garfield Ellis's work. Um, and there's a third, uh, there's a fourth novel. And of course, um, all of them, are really focused around the, the violence and the, the sharp divisions, the almost civil war atmosphere of the, 1970s, the late 1970s, but also a period of extraordinary cultural ferment in Jamaica um, that, that accompanied this period and was in fact um, part of the fuel of, of you know, Jamaica trying to find itself in the world. Um, so yeah, so any of those novels really will bring you back as a young person to that period. Very interesting. Okay, I know you've served on many boards, many important boards and committees, and there are too many to list, but one thing um, that I know that you did uh, at the UWI Mona was uh, to be the public orator. Yeah. Um, and I know that we, we discussed this briefly before you started, and I think you prepared 74 citations as your time as public orator. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this, this is actually um, graduation period. We've just had the open campus graduation and the um, Cape Hill graduation. And we're heading now into St. Augustine and, and Mona. Yes. So tell, tell us just a, a brief snippet of, of, of what it was like to be public orator. Um, challenging. <laughs> um, what, uh, what people don't, well, I shouldn't say they don't understand, but let me just say it without saying whether people understand it or not. Um, every August or September, I would have a list of six or seven um, people who were awarded. And I, what you would have to do is you get a sort of brief summary of what they were being awarded for, but then you'd have to do, go out and research them, either interview them, or in most cases interview them, or um, literally um, dig up material on them that will, that will really s explain why it is that they got this award. Um, some people, it was easier than others. For example, you know, I, I always think that I was fortunate to be, to be public orator in the time of Usain Bolt, yeah. um, and to, ha to have written a speech for Bolt, which I, th I still think is on his website. Uh, it was up until recently. I haven't checked it recently. I'm sure it's still there. Um, yeah, but um, you know that was like um, certainly for me the one the most memorable. But there are so many other people: um, John Maxwell, Jamaican journalist; Erna Bradbury, you know, one of our outstanding um, alums of the university as well. Um, uh, and I could go on and on. But I would say that um, at the beginning of doing it you felt burdened by having to write these six again. At the end, you felt enriched by having delved into the lives of these people and hopefully having do done them um, justice in terms of capturing in a, in a very brief, um, really tiny nutshell, um, the substance of, you know, in, in almost all instances, were outstanding lives. So there was something about that condensation, uh, an act of doing it, which was worthwhile, even though um, I, mean, I could have written a couple of books well if I had not had to spend my, my what we call up here, falls, right? But it's Michaelmas in the Caribbean, in, 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 in at Mona, in that season, yeah. um, writing these speeches. Yeah, no, I know. I know how time-consuming it was because I mean, you basically yeah. work from August until until graduation time. Until graduation, and then after graduation, you're dead until 
Christmas at least because <laughs> of that. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, um, I, 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 I think it's worthwhile. Maybe one day, um, I'll publish them together. I was about to suggest that. I think that would be excellent. That would be yeah, a really awesome. great collection. It's um, something, and something that, that I would definitely consider. Yes, I, I hope that you do, and I hope that you actually do it too. Thank but I have to say that um, you, your time as public orator is still remembered today. Many people still talk about the, the citations that you gave. So kudos again. I mean, I think you did an excellent job and, and people remember them. Well, I've, I've followed in, 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 in the footsteps of Eddie Ball, who, yes. who I, I certainly was in awe of um, in, in listening to his work and his, his as a wordsmith. And what he did, so um, you know, I had uh, you know very very um, big boots to try to fill, and um, you know, it's not for me to say whether I filled them or I didn't fill them, but I certainly um, had a marker to work towards. Absolutely, Eddie Boy is, is absolutely amazing, and and I think, as you said, everybody has their own stamp to put on things, and I think you put your stamp on very well. Thank you. So, now let's uh, talk a little bit about your public service. You've had many varied affiliations. You are a member of the board of directors of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, a member of the board of Jamaica College, which I'm sure some Jamaica JCO boys will be happy to hear, uh, a council member of the Caribbean Studies Association, chairman of the Michael Manley Foundation. Um, as we've said before, you've been on, um, done co commentaries on Jamaican and Caribbean issues for the BBC Overseas and Caribbean Services, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, The Guardian, Financial Times, Billboard, The Miami Herald, Time and Reuters, among others. And you've been a guest member of the um, Reuters, among others, mm -hmm. and guest member of the Jamaican Current Affairs talk show, The Breakfast Club. Um, as we're now running a little bit out of time, I want mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about your, your other interest, which is poetry, which yeah. I found very interesting. And I believe you published the Ku Klux Clicks. Ku Klux Clicks, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that you were a poet. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was a poet before I was all anything else. Um, because I published poet, poetry from in, in high school and actually got a uh, a festival um, bronze medal for poetry at age 16. Um, and um, certainly in, in, in the early part of my life, I was an active poet, you know, published in um, Sabaku, which was Ed, Ed, Eddie Kamau Brathwaite's um, very famous volume published in the early 70s. Um, his New Jamaican Poets volume, which, which he edited in that period. And then I stopped writing um, as other parts of my life took over. Um, so the Ku Klux Klicks is really a collection of poems from my early period up until the 1980s. And therefore is very much a time capsule of poetry as opposed to what I'm doing today. Um, and I'm very, I'm very happy that it has come out because I think it captures and is really a companion volume to my novel, Paint the Town Red, a particular period of time um, across the Caribbean, indeed, Trinidad, Jamaica, most of it is Jamaica, um, Grenada is there too. Um, and um, it's, really, it's really something that I'm glad I've done um, and hope, hopefully it will be a spur to me writing more um, which implies that I'm not writing much, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, I think everybody would be agree that it's very interesting that as a, an academic, you also write novels and poetry. So that's an interesting as aspect that I'm sure I'm, not a lot of people knew. Um, a graduate now um, from our open campus in Antigua uh, says, notes that you're now at Brown University, but you are a UWI Pelican. And now that UWI is officially in the top 4% of the world universities, um, as you travel around the world, and, and I think they must have listened to all the, all the public lectures and so on that you've given, mm -hmm. how do you find UWI's reputation? UWI has a distinct reputation, um, but it needs to constantly work at reinforcing it. Um, there's a whole generation of 
scholars in the academy in the United States um, who have UWI roots. Um, in the generation before me, there are people like um, Orlando Patterson as perhaps the most outstanding one that I can think about. Um, people like Loxley Edmondson, who was at Cornell for years and is now retired, um, who again are UWI products, and there are many more. Um, then there are people of my generation, um, Tony Bogues, who I mentioned before, who is here at Brown with me, and David Scott, who I mentioned before, is at Columbia. Charles Mills, um, who in many respects is uh, the, the respect with which Mills is head in the in the philosophy world is is not known in the Caribbean, but he is highly respected. He's at um, the Graduate School of the City University of New York. Um, all of these are UWI people, um, you know, um, um, and I could go on to mention many more, um, but I don't think. It, it is sufficiently realized their connections to UWI. And um, there, there's not a way in which it is sufficiently reinforced by UWI itself. Celia note um, that there is work to be done um, with, 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 with identifying and recognizing the people who are, who are out there. Um, but certainly, um, UWI has, has a long-standing reputation as um, a place of post-colonial studies. Um, it's certainly it's literary um, people, including, of course, most outstandingly, Derek Walcott, Kamal Brathwaite, um, are well-respected in, 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 in the world. But I think there's got to be reinforcement and there's got to be rec greater recognition of those um, who are out there and who are doing uh, remarkable things. Absolutely, um, I, I agree 100% and yeah. it's in our plans, but I, I, um, I'm actually gonna be speaking to you again so you can give me a full list so we can, of those that you know, sure. and I'll just make a general appeal to graduates out there as I'm a little younger and I don't know all of the people and unfortunately not all of our records are up to date, but any, anyone can please contact me and give me information on outstanding graduates that we need to know about and talk about and expose then, the world to. So. Yeah, and, then, and then there's a younger set, you know? I mean, some of my students, you know, I can think of people like Greg Graham, Nicosia Shakes. These are people who I taught um, who are now um, creating waves uh, as young scholars in, in, in North America. Um, so yeah, so um, I mean, and they're, they're in the UK as well, in Canada. Right. So we need to talk. <laughs> Absolutely. And Marlon James, as you mentioned before. So Absolutely. Um, it's gonna, I, I'm excited about that. So Absolutely. this is a good outcome of this, this interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next question uh, is from a graduate of our open campus in Antigua. Um, another one from Antigua. Uh, and they want to know what you do when you're not hard at work. Ha. What do I do? Um, my, myself and my wife like to drive. And um, one of the things about living in New England is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very beautiful part of the United States. You know, very temperate, but very beautiful, very close to the sea. Um, you know, the famous offshore places or onshore places like Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Cape Cod, are within uh, arm's reach of, of um, Providence, where, which is where um, we live. We actually live in a town called Bristol, which is not very far from Providence. Newport, um, Rhode Island is down the road from us. Um, so driving, um, stopping occasionally, and um, finding a little restaurant or inn and having lunch or coffee um, is, is a pastime on a Friday or Saturday. And of course, when we get a chance to travel, um, you know, one does the things one does when traveling. When in New York, you do the New York thing. When in, in London, you 
well, London, you find friends and they find you. But um, so, you know, all of those things, what traveling is, is very much a part of, of what we do. Um, or just, you know, sometimes you just crash and you binge on Netflix, you know. That's part of, that's part of what we do. <laughs> that's right. So now as we, as we start to close, um, what are your major inspirations or who have been your major inspirations and influences in your professional and personal life? Who do you acknowledge? In my professional life, um, probably um, Gordon Rollier, who was um, one of my, he, he was a, a professor in St. Augustine of literature of English literature, but he, he was Guyanese. He studied at Mona and he had a wonderful collection of Jamaican, early Jamaican music, as well as of Calypso. And Rollier taught me to read society through popular culture. And so I think Gordon was a huge influence on me, even though I probably have never said it quite like that before. Another one was Kamal Brathwaite who actually taught me, uh, made me feel that my poetry was worthwhile. Um, and, you know, there's so many others who I have, have inspired at a distance at Mona, people like Carl Stone, um, Trevor Monroe, Rupert Lewis, all of these were the people ahead of me in the Department of Government and who in different ways inspired my work um, or, or gave me the space to do work. Um, in my personal life, um, you know, my, my mother and father are still very much there. Um, you know, I, I, I think my father taught me integrity and um, um, simple things about how to be a father, um, which I try to emulate, not as well as he did, but I try. Um, and my mom um, was always a cornerstone of what was possible. She was Trinidad's first female island scholar. Um, and she, she was sharp as a blade um, and taught me that if you wanted to survive around her, you needed to be sharp as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so, you know, they're very much a huge influence on my, on my, on my early life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what are your greatest joys? Your your wife and daughters, I'm sure. But <laughs> my, my, my 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 greatest joys, I, I, I agree with you, um, absolutely. Um, you know, um, my 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 children and my wife, my wife and my children, uh, my my older son Neto, my two girls Anya and Sarah, um, are remarkable achievements to know that you have brought human beings into this world and that they have gone forth. Then um, the, the girls are now adults. And um, it's quite, it, 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 it's, it's every day you, 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 you reflect on them as infants, toddlers, and now here they are making their way in the world. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to be where I am. Um, the, 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 the travels of life continue, but um, philosophically, you know, we are, you know, happy. And that's the most important thing. I Absolutely. think you, you've shown us. Uh, thank you for sharing these various aspects of your life with us. It's been really very, very interesting and enlightening. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed today's Pelican Talk with our distinguished guest, Professor Brian Meeks. I'd like to thank Howard Shand, our digital media and database manager who facilitates this interview. And we look forward to you all joining us on our next Pelican Talk where we engage alumni across the Caribbean and the world in novel and enriching exchanges. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember to show your Pelican pride. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Celia. Bye-bye. All right, Brian. Thank you.